my main interest, well, there's several interests really that, that, that coexist, but one aspect, let's say one aspect of the space poetry work was for the work to be made in outer space, not brought from Earth. Uh, the parts wouldn't be brought from Earth. The materials wouldn't be brought from Earth. The work would be made in space with materials that are already available there. And this is, you, you might think this as process, but in reality it has a very important symbolic charge and that is integral to the work because we humans will one day live outside of the Earth. Quite possibly initially on the moon because it's closer to home. If there is a problem, we can resolve it quickly, relatively speaking. And eventually, after we learn from what it's like to live on the moon, eventually we might send humans uh, to Mars. We might be brave enough and just go directly to Mars. We'll see. But in any case, sooner or later, humans will spend time on the surface of another body that is not Earth itself. And when we do, we will make art because that's who we are. We make art. And when we make art in an environment that is not the Earth, we will make alien art. We will make art that is of a different world, literally. There's nothing mystical, nothing magical. It's quite material and, and literal and also very powerful because it's the beginning of a new culture. Not a culture on Earth that we think about and we talk about and we make pictures about space. This would be a true space culture in the sense that we begin to colonize, we begin to live, we begin to inhabit a completely new environment. And the modes of expression and the modes of psychological response and insights, uh, the relationships, the use of materials, all of it will be a consequence of this new world that we're going to live in. So this is a first step. This work being made in space, it's not an earthly artwork. It's an alien artwork. It's a work that is made in zero gravity outside of the atmosphere. In orbit, yes, the this, this space station is in orbit. And this implies a lot of different things too, because one day for us is 16 days for them. They orbit the Earth 16 times. And the fact that you are in zero gravity has all kinds of implications, many of which I try to build into the, the work itself. I coined the, the terms gravitropism and gravimorphism in the 80s. It would have been 86 or 87 that I published an essay uh, in which these terms would, would have appeared the first time. And I originally coined these terms in the context of my work in holo poetry, holographic poetry, because by working with light, by writing poems with light in space and time, I was able to overcome the notion of print media, right? So poetry, uh, l language is fluid in the way we think, the way we use language. But when we think of a poem as a printed object, all the way from gravity pushing ink onto the paper to the fixed structure of a poem that allows itself to be reproduced, read, memorized in school, right? Um, all of this is, is counter to the true fluid and discontinuous nature of language. So my poetic vision has always been from the beginning to not only talk about that fact, but to seize media, work with media, push media beyond the brink to give the reader the lived experience of language as a truly perceivable, fluid, discontinuous medium. Right? So by writing with photons, Photons are particles. They don't have mass. So I'm not, I was not bound, when I wrote the whole poems, by the limitations of gravity, of materials, of making a ladder out of wood. Of course, the moon orbits the Earth because of gravity. So we're not talking about the fact that you're writing with light, you're completely free from gravity. But from the point of view of perception, from the point of view of the reader who is engaged in a reading act, right, the fact that I'm writing with light I do not have these limitations. So if I drop this cup, it will fall and it will break. But as I write with light, those letters float in space continuously. They do not fall. They're not made of ceramic or, or wood. And they don't have fixed boundaries. I can make one word transform into another or transform into an image or transform into evanescent light. And I have done those things in my holopoms. 
So I coined the term uh, in the context of the creation of the holographic poetry. Because my search for this type of poetry goes back to 1982 when I made my first digital uh, digital work, digital poem. My first holo poem is from 83. My first work online is from 85. So there is this continuity of, of a search. And now with the space poetry, uh, I reach a, another level of exploration of this idea. Why? Because gravimorphism refers to the fact that form is affected by gravity. Uh, that is pretty much uh, self-evident uh, on Earth. But not until you ask, what if we did not have that limitation? So the entire history of poetry and the entire history of art is affected by gravity in very clear, direct, material ways. Not metaphoric, not allegoric, not symbolic, very direct, material ways. From making the first pigment and painting the first picture in a cave, right? So that has to stay, can't fall off. The, so you have to, in a, in a sense, counter the effect of gravity that would make that pigment slide off the wall. It has to adhere to the texture of the wall, right, to stay. Ink, when you print a book, ink has to be pushed into the fiber, into the, the very substrate of the paper to, to retain. Think of painting Pollock. If Pollock would drip onto a canvas in outer space, the ink would just fly off. There would be no action painting in outer space. So the entire history of art, the entire history of poetry is affected in a lot of different ways by gravity. But what happens if we don't have that limitation? What poetry could we write? What art could we make? What performance could we create uh, in, without these conditions? So uh, that's why anti-gravitropism, anti-gravimorphism are central tenets of space poetry. In our telescope, the, the work that I made in outer space with the cooperation of French astronaut uh, Thomas Pesquet aboard the International Space Station is, is a piece that is, is really conceived for zero gravity. And, and it was made in space, so it, it, it's, it's born in space. It's, it emerges out of the conditions of zero gravity. In what way? In zero gravity, in outer space, the concept of up and down does not apply. Inside the space station, they work on all walls. There is no ceiling, there is no floor. It's a 360 environment, right? So up and down doesn't exist. Left and right, as a result, doesn't exist either. And this notion of front and back is also relative because you're, you're floating in zero gravity. So I created a piece that has no top or down, no left or right, no front or back. The piece works in every conceivable direction. And given my long interest for the semiotic continuum between word and image, depending on how you float in space, because you, you know, for you as a reader, you have to be floating in space to experience this work too, right? So depending on how you position yourself at a given point in time relative to the work, you might see it as an image and you, or you might see it as a word. It's relative to your point of view, not far removed from my work in holographic poetry. So many of the lessons that I learned from creating holographic poems translate into the creation of, of this work. So I have made a video that's 12 minutes long in which you first see Thomas making a letter M. And as he cuts, all the parts fly away. He has to collect them because it's in zero gravity anyway. And then he cuts a circle in the center, which is the letter O. So you first you see this form, which you could think of as a letter M. And then you see the circle in the center, which you could think of as, as a letter O. The next step is for him to roll a sheet of paper into a cylinder and introduce that into that hole, making the letter I. So at that point, you might think that you're reading the letter, uh, the word moi which is me or myself, depending on the, on the context. But obviously, it's neither him or me, it's all of us. It's synodically humanity, right? But as he releases the work, stops grabbing it and lets it go, and as it begins to turn, you notice that from another perspective, what you really see 
is a head, two arms, two legs, and the umbilical cord cut. And in the background, what you have is our home planet, Mother Earth. So this cutting of the umbilical cord is clearly symbolic, uh, a symbolic gesture in relation to us freeing ourselves from the constraints of, of gravity. But not only that, the work was conceived to navigate the air currents of the International Space Station. So the sides, which you can see as, say, the, 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 the structure of the letter M on the side, or the arms and the legs, depending on point of view, they function like sails that allow the work to be gently moved by air currents. And the cylinder is a stabilizing form that gives it uh, navigational ability. Right? So the form as a whole makes its way gently in the course of these 12 minutes towards the cupola, which is the only window available in, in the International Space Station. And as it caresses the space station and negotiates that very complex environment with, with its very gentle dance, finally it arrives uh, at the cupola where day and night shift dramatically, the lighting shifts dramatically, so the work diffracts light, interacts with the light uh, of, of the earth as it interacts with the sun. And, and eventually it's a full day for a while in orbit and then you see the glorious blue bubble in which we inhabit and the work uh, floating uh, in front of it. So that's, that's what happens in the course of 12 minutes. Now, if you look at this form in relation to the space station, you also notice something else. And that is the fact that the space station itself is made fundamentally of cylinders, which are the modules that they inhabit, and planes, which are the solar panels. Cylinders and planes. My work is one cylinder and one plane. So it's in dialogue with the space station as this modular unit of a uh, zero gravity architecture. There are all these different aspects uh, to the work. But one thing that might be interesting to, uh, to highlight in the context of Inner Telescope is the performance. Because the work itself, once it is made, so making it is, is performative, right? And the shift in subject position that occurs was the astronaut stops making and now the work exists, right? So he's no longer the performer, he's no longer uh, an avatar uh, making the work. Now he is the first observer, the first reader. And, and due to the kinesthetic demands of the work, he too has to float with it and he has to experience the work in relation to what's happening to the work and to himself, right? He cannot control it because it is made to navigate the air current. So it is doing all kinds of things that escape his control. But as a reader, he has to, or as a viewer, he has to perform with it uh, to be able to experience it. So the performance, I call it performance for one astronaut, two sheets of paper, and one pair of scissors, right? So the work has the ambition of also being a performance, right? So it's, it's, it's a poem, it's a visual work of art, it's a performance, uh, it's symbolically this gesture of make, being the first to make a, an alien artwork. It has all these ambitions simultaneously, right? And, um, and, and this performance is, is interesting uh, in, in itself, primarily because of this um, this shift uh, in perspective and the demands that that shift uh, place on the on the performer in relation to its environment.